Yeah, thanks a lot for this kind introduction. Um, this tutorial is joint work with Jacek and Matthias and David, and, and we're from Amazon. So here's an outline uh, of the tutorial. I first going to talk a little bit about some difficulties that we face when comparing HBO, hyperparameter optimization methodology, with each other. And particularly, I'm going to highlight some confounding factors that plague quite a few of these comparisons and that we should aim to control. Then I'm going to go um, briefly over some basic concepts of hyperparameter optimization um, and some methods, and uh, along the way introduce how this uh, business is done in SignTune, which is a library uh, that we build and open sourced and which can help uh, alleviating some of these factors. Now, SignTune supports different um, trial execution backends and also makes parallel experimentation quite easy in order to speed up the process. And I'm going to also illustrate that with two small examples. And then finally, uh, David and myself are going to uh, dive a little bit deeper into how we simulate, uh, how we do realistic simulations uh, of HBO experiments uh, using surrogate benchmarks. Okay, so uh, hi hyperparameter optimization is a very important kind of topic in, in industry, in academia, and uh, one example I particularly like is uh, when DeepMind, uh, quite a few years back, more or less uh, solved the game of Go uh, in terms of AI versus human by beating the world's best Go player back then, uh, Lisa Dahl, quite decisively in a couple of matches. Um, and the ingredients into the success story are well known, right? I mean, it's uh, advances in deep reinforcement learning, an amazing group of people uh, putting their strength together and also a massively parallel compute. But hyperparameter tuning also played a role in this success because just a few days before the final match, they tuned quite a number of hyperparameters, free parameters in the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm uh, behind this AlphaGo AI, and they managed to boost the maximum expected win rate, right? which, which uh, ha had an influence on, on what they, how they did in the final matches. So given that uh, hyperparameter optimization is so important, how do practitioners make a choice between different methods um, in order to figure out what fits uh, their problem the best? Um, and this choice is, uh, is difficult because there's a wealth of HBO methods out there and new, new ones are invented all the time and they're implemented in different code bases. Um, I'm just listing uh, a few here. Uh, I mean, this, this list could go on for many pages. So Raytune, Optuna, Bowtorch, uh, we've heard about open source VCA yesterday and Hebo. There's HP, Benster, Deep, Dragonfly, and the list could go on, right? So how do people make a choice between them? Well, I mean, informed choices require comparisons between these methods, and these comparisons are pretty hard to set up and they are very expensive to run. So uh, one, um, one very principled way to uh, make such comparisons cheaper and also faster to run is to use surrogate benchmarks. So what's a surrogate benchmark or a tabulated benchmark? The idea is pretty simple. You just use a lot of compute by running all sorts of uh, evaluations of your benchmark, which basically means training a model, maybe a neural network for many epochs, and record everything that you see along the way, like validation loss, possibly training loss, and also very importantly, the time it took to get to each epoch. So that gives you a big table of numbers, and in order to sort of um, complete this table to the full configuration space, you typically use some interpolation methods. And then you hopefully you know, make that data public for other people to use it. That's the surrogate benchmark. So once you have a surrogate benchmark, you can simulate experimentation. So instead of having to pay the real price for t t uh, training this neural network, you just sort of uh, ask the, the surrogate benchmark for the values. And because you also recorded the training times, you can do realistic uh, simulations from the surrogate benchmark. And that allows you to very quickly compare different me methods with each other, subject to the fact that you're using a surrogate benchmark. 
And there's a growing number of these surrogate benchmarks available, so people really uh, um, know how important this is, and they I do make that effort. So there, again, this list is maybe too short, but uh, the ones that I know of are NAS Bench 101, 201, 301, FCNet, LC Bench, uh, Yapo Jim is adding quite a few new ones, and then HBO Bench is also an umbrella to um, you know serve many of these black boxes through the same framework. So however we kind of compare hyperparameter optimization with each other, whether with real benchmarks or with surrogate benchmarks, we, we face a number of confounding factors that we often see in these comparisons. So the first factor is that if you compare uh, methods that are implemented in different code bases, often these code bases, they run their own uh, different uh, execution backend in order to run trials in parallel. So nowadays we don't run trials sequentially, but we try to run them in parallel. And uh, you know, if you now do that, if you do such a comparisons between method A and B and they're implemented in, in different code bases, then it's very hard to disentangle whether a difference between these methods comes from the methods making better decisions or simply the, the execution backend being implemented in a different way. So that's one, one factor that sort of makes these comparisons difficult. Um, a second one is more about uh, simulated uh, experiments from surrogate benchmarks. And there it often tends to be the case that people say, yes, I'm using a surrogate benchmark, but they actually do a different type of simulation, uh, possibly for the experiment they're running, possibly even for the implementation of the method. It, the method might come with their own implementation of how to do uh, the simulation, and then you're kind of comparing different simulations against each other. And often these simulations are not uh, what I would call a war clock time realistic. So if you kind of plot results against war clock time, you're, you're often not exactly getting the same result as if you had not used the surrogate mo model and instead trained the neural network for real. And then... Uh, and then finally, often uh, it also happens, this is sort of related to the first fa factor, is that simple baselines uh, that we should always compare against actually also come from different code bases, and so um, sometimes they are a little outdated. And so again, now you're comparing um, you know, two different methods, one being a simple baseline, the other one being some more advanced method, and it's often hard to disentangle whether the differences are due to the method making better decisions or due to simply just uh, a different code base being used. So this has been certainly recognized, and a lot has been done about it. Um, and one idea uh, to improve on the situation is to try to do a certain standardization by sharing tools among people. Um, so there have been efforts to unify benchmarking. Um, so there, for example, HBO Bench, also X is a, is a powerful framework for experimentation in general, and AutoML benchmarks. And uh, in, you know, these, these frameworks, they allow you to sort of access different benchmarks uh, along this, uh, the same umbrella kind of framework. And thereby, uh, you know, things are kind of improved uh, in terms of standardization. There's also efforts to unify HBO methodologies, so they are, they are basically HBO libraries that uh, basically contain, that allow you to run many different algorithms um, uh, against the same execution backend, for example, Raytune and Optuna. And I would simply just like to highlight uh, the library, a library that we built called SignTune, um, that basically helps also to bridge the gap that still sort of exists between uh, baseline methods and benchmarking. So SignTune is, uh, is an open source library, so you can uh, download it from GitHub, and it's used in SageMaker automatic model tuning. So it's kind of uh, you know, be behind some of the methods that are offered through this uh, service. Um, it has modular implementations of many HBO baselines, um, and new methods are really fairly easy to add. It supports different execution backends, so you can run your comparisons under different uh, you know, situations using different backends, but, but you can limit your, uh, your comparison to the same backend. So there's a local backend that runs on a single machine, there's a cloud based distributed backend, and there's also a simulator backend. And this is maybe uh, 
most relevant to this uh, kind of tutorial, the simulator backend, and together with a black box repository that we're going to look a little bit more into detail later on, allows you to do walk talk time realistic simulations from surrogate benchmarks, and you can use any method, and you can simulate any kind of number of workers if you want. Okay, so I'm so let, let's go a little bit uh, look at some basic concepts of HBO and how they basically arise in SignTune. So for that, I'm just going to pick a very simple benchmark. Uh, let's just train a transformer on the Wikitex 2 uh, data set. That's a pretty small transformer, uh, I think only two layers, and so uh, very small by today's standards, but just to make things tractable to do. Um, now that's easy, right? You just learn a lot of weights um, by stochastic gradient descent. You validate the final model on held out data and you ship it. The problem with that is that uh, there are some hyperparameters that you also need to set and they determine the outcome to a large extent, like the learning rate of the optimizer or the batch size or the dropout or the momentum or the clip uh, of the gradient and so on, right? So, and these parameters are important to get them right. And so how, how are we going to set them without spending uh, countless iterations of manual work? So one, one uh, powerful way to think about such problems is, uh, is kind of the framework of black box global optimization. So imagine just put all the hyperparameters that you're interested in tuning into a bigger vector and uh, the, the space spent by all these configurations that would be the configuration space. Then you basically pick a, a metric that you want to minimize. In, in this talk, I'm not going to talk about multi-objective, but that's also possible. Um, so for example, the validation loss is something you might want to minimize, and that's going to be function f of x. And then the goal is in Backbox global optimization is to solve the optimization problem of minimizing this, uh, this function over the configuration space. Now, evaluating this function is really expensive. It needs training until convergence, um, and that can take hours or days, right? Um, so we want to approximate uh, a good optimum of this function, possibly the global optimum, um, as fast as possible with as few um, evaluations as possible. And so there's no analytical form for this function. Um, we don't really know how, what properties it has, and there's also no gradient that you can get. On top of that, the evaluations may be noisy, so um, you, you have random effects here like uh, weight initialization and batch ordering. And so you, are, you have some additional noise on top of this function. So you, in, in, in principle, this problem is to uh, optimize a, a random unknown function that you can only access through point sampling. And you want to do this uh, with as few samples as possible. OK, so um, how, uh, how do we define a problem that we want to solve with HBO? There's two things uh, you want to do, right? First, you take the training script for the model that you're interested in tuning, and you annotate it a little bit. And then you also need to define the search space, the configuration space. So this is how um, a training script is annotated in SignTune. It's not much different from other frameworks. So this is, this is a very streamed, streamed down kind of uh, objective for our transformer training problem. It depends on the hyperparameter configuration. It's just a dictionary. And the first thing you do is you download the data, um, and then you kind of split the data into training validation set, and you set up uh, iterators over them. And all of this depends on the hyperparameter configuration, potentially. Like, for example, the training iterator depends on the batch size. And then you actually create a callback, um, which is used to relay information back to SignTune. And then you create the model, the optimizer. And again, this depends on the hyperparameter configuration, because the optimizer, for example, depends on the learning rate. And the model depends on dropout and these kind of things, right? So then you, uh, it's an iterative method. So you so iterate over epochs, over the data. Uh, and again, the maximum epochs is an input. And then you train on the data within the epoch iteration. And then you validate at the end of the epoch on the validation data. And you report that metric value back to SignTune, right? Because that's the metric you're interested in optimizing. And it's important to report, uh, in this case, to report back after every epoch, because that supports um, more clever algorithms that use early stopping or multi-fidelity. And, and we're going to see what that is in a second. If you're not interested in multi-fidelity, you can also just report once at the end. Right? But I'm, I highly recommend to do it that way, because that just gives you a bigger umbrella of methods that you can use. So the second. Um, 
the second input to, to this problem would be the definition of the search or configuration space, and that's simply just a list of all the hyperparameters you want to tune. So in this case, it's the learning rate, um, the dropout, uh, batch size, momentum, and some gradient clipping parameter. And for each of these hyperparameters, you have to define the type. So is it real or, or, or integer? Um, you can also use categorical, which is not something we do here. And then you need to put bounds on these things. Um, and, and these can be fairly wide, like the dropout is really almost between 0 and 1. And then um, you also want to basically say something about the typical scaling of these parameters. So is it logarithmic or is it like more linear? And then uh, you can back package this up and sign tune into a benchmark definition, where you, which basically just contains everything the method should know, like this, uh, what the script is, uh, what the configuration space is, including some fixed parameters that are just sent to the script, um, like the model size or the number of epochs, and then also a few other informations. And that's kind of what you give to sign tune and say, please tune that for me with a method. Okay, what are some simple methods? Here are some very simple baselines, grid search and random search. Uh, in grid search, uh, you just grid up your dimensions and you then basically exhaustively evaluate everything uh, until you run out of budget, and then you basically report the best. And random search is possibly a little more clever. It's picking configurations uniformly at random from the configuration space. So there are some arguments why random search typically should outperform grid search. Um, if, there's a if, if the dependence between the hyperparameters and the function is kind of stronger for some of them. Both of these methods are very, very simple to implement, so people really like them. They are also embarrassingly parallel, so they typically, um, you can run them on many instances in parallel, and you typically get something called linear speed up out of that. But they are also very expensive and quite wasteful of resources, so you can often actually do better than these methods with other um, black box methods that are equally easy to run. But they are important baselines. Random search is always something that you need to compare against. So how can we, how can we do better than random search? So one idea is to select the next configuration based on the results from earlier trials, right? And that's kind of the idea behind Bayesian optimization, which is a probabilistic approach to gradient-free optimization. And the idea is, uh, is pretty simple. So you build a probabilistic model of the objective. So you sample the objective that gives you data, growing amount of data about it, pretty sparse, and you put a probabilistic model, you fit a probabilistic model to that data. It's important that this model captures uncertainty um, because you, you don't exhaustively sample this method. Um, so the uncertainty is obtained by computing a posterior between the assumptions in the model and the data that you condition on. And then this like probabilistic model is used to perform a sample efficient search by balancing exploration against exploitation. So exploration would be more or less what random search is doing. So you spread your bets all over. And exploitation is using kind of the information that you already got to maybe refine um, you know, around the minimum that you have so far. And balancing these two ideas with each other in a good way over time is, is really key to, to do a good job in black box global optimization. And yeah. So more in detail, uh, Bayesian optimization is uh, basically constructing an acquisition function. So you take your, uh, your probabilistic model and you put it into the acquisition function. And the acquisition function is not, uh, it's not a probabilistic model. It's a fixed, it's a, it's a deterministic decision function. It allows you to basically say where it would be most information about uh, where to, uh, which configuration would relay most information given the information you already have about where the, where the optimum should be, right? So you maximize this acquisition function in every round, which gives you the configuration for the next evaluation. So different to the true objective function, this function is easy to evaluate. It's rather cheap. And um, it's also like differentiable, so you can compute gradients of it. Right? So you can do a gradient-based optimization with an off-the-shelf solver. It's still a global optimization problem, but it's, uh, I mean, you just solve it as good as you can. And solving this problem gives you the next configuration that you sample, and this is a sequential iteration. So another idea to do better than random search on, the, on these type of problems is to, is to look more specifically into the structure of the problem. So for example, neural networks are trained for many epochs. 
And uh, um, if, if you validate early, right, then, then, then you get a kind of a noisy approximation of the validation error further down the line. And this uh, approximation might be, might already contain quite a bit of information about kind of what happens later. So for example, the idea would be that if you um, have a pretty poor performance early on, then you, it might be safe to stop this trial and instead to run a new one uh, in order to distribute your budget in a better way. So more concretely, this is this kind of the idea behind that. So, so the umbrella term of this is multi-fidelity. Uh, I mean, this is at least a specific instance of multi-fidelity. And one um, very popular method in this space is successive halving. So the idea of successive halving, if you compare it to random search, random search, you take all, each of your configurations and you run it uh, until the end. You, you train for 40 epochs, let's say, right? Instead, successive halving is kind of more or less touching more configurations, but it trains them for shorter. So it spreads the bed. So, so in this case, for example, you, you take 81 configurations and you just train them for one epoch. You get a very noisy kind of validation error after one epoch. Then you sort all these errors and you take the top third and you continue, you allow them to go to three epochs. And then you get a little less noisy estimate and then you sort that again, you take the top third and you train these nine ones to nine epochs and then you train the top third to 27 epochs and then you are left with three and you take the best and you, that's the one that you're allowed to go to 40 epochs. So the idea is really a filtering approach, right? So if you really, instead of just giving every configuration that you draw out of your random hat uh, 40 epochs, you, you, you really ask for this uh, configuration to prove itself at different uh, points uh, like in, in time which are called rung levels. So rung levels is what happens after one epoch, after three epoch, after nine epochs. so there's this exponential spacing. So one uh, property of successive halving, it's a very simple method. Uh, one property that it has, which can be a little unfortunate, is this, it's synchronous. So for example, think about what has to happen uh, for you to be able to promote any trials to run for three epochs. You have to first finish all the training until one epoch for all these 81 trials. Before that, you can't make a decision about any of them, right? And this happens again at three epochs, at nine epochs. This happens at all these different rungs. And so these are synchronization points and synchronization points can be wasteful in, in distributed practice. So that's why people came up with an asynchronous uh, variant of this. Uh, it's called asynchronous successive halving or ASHA. So it just works in the following way. So you have rungs, and each rung sits at this different number of epochs, 1, 3, 9, 27. And think about a rung as being simply just a list of every, every trial that got to this uh, number of epochs is listed there along with this validation error. And these rungs kind of grow over time, right? So that's different to the synchronous method where the, the rung is kind of a fixed size and once it's full, you just promote it. So, and then the Usher method is doing the following. Um, whenever a try, it's important to note that all the decisions that we are making here are instantaneous, so nobody ever waits for anything. So, the, um, if a trial reaches a rung, so it comes to one epoch, it's paused there, so you checkpoint it there. And then, uh, if you have any, uh, any resource free, you immediately make a decision what to do with it. You, so, so, you go through all the rungs and you look at whether you find any trial that is still paused in this rung, but it's in the top third. So that's a good sign. You can then promote this trial and say, okay, you can go on training towards the next rung. So if it's sitting at uh, rung uh, epoch three, then it can go on to nine. And if you don't find any such uh, trials, then uh, if they're all like, uh, you know, either if they're, if they're all in the, in the lower two thirds, then, then you can start a new trial um, and, and that can kind of starts from scratch. So that's Asha. And that's asynchronous in, uh, you know, compared to synchronous success halving, and we can look at the difference a little later on. So then, uh, can we do better than, than either of these ideas? Well, one idea is to combine them, right? So you can take this kind of clever scheduling that sort of filters out, uh, you know, trials um, in an asynchronous way, and you can also select the next configuration in an intelligent way as in VO. And there are different ways to do that. Uh, to do model-based ASHA, there are a number of methods around now. One of them is Mobster that, that we did in a while back, and then there's Hypertune, which is an extension. And uh, the idea, the rough idea behind these methods is that you use a joint probabilistic model 
to fit the performances of hyperparameter configurations across these resource levels. So these, this model is kind of jointly dependent along uh, kind of um, you know, per epoch sampling, like along the learning curve and the configurations. And then you use an acquisition function which essentially integrates the information of, uh, the, of the data that you have along the learning curve and gives you a statement about a configuration, right? So what, uh, what's the value of starting this, this new configuration, right? Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of some um, ideas how you could combine these kind of two ideas and we will later see how this works. Okay, so now let's, let's say we want to compare these four different methods in SignTune. So all of these methods are implemented as baselines. We have many more baselines included. So the only thing you need to do in order to compare them or in order to compare them to your latest method is to just select them, put them in the kind of a dictionary that says these are the methods I want to compare against. Um, we have templates for synchronous and asynchronous multi-fidelity methods that you can just extend by your own idea about how to do model-based or how to do decisions in this, in this context. And there's also pretty simple API to include your own code, right, in your decision-making code uh, behind uh, your latest HBO idea. So um, then the third part is uh, I'm going to talk about uh, trial execution backends and parallel experimentation in SignTune. So what's a, a trial execution backend? I, I used the term trial already. I'm, I apologize. It's basically simply just uh, training for one configuration and reporting metrics after every epoch. And this might actually be paused and resumed later, then it's still a trial, but it's always linked to a configuration. And the backend is kind of the component of the uh, hyperparameter optimization system that executes these trials that are suggested by the uh, HBO method. So this is kind of a schema of the interaction between these two components, um, and I think every HBO system kind of has them. Um, so there are basically two things that happen in such an asynchronous system. Um, one uh, is that uh, a trial just reports something, so it, it reached the end of an epoch. It reports uh, uh, some validation loss, uh, and then the execution backend relays that uh, back to the HBO method. The HBO method can then uh, update its knowledge state, and it can then decide, uh, this is important for multi-fidelity, um, whether it might want to stop this trial, right? Or it says, okay, we can continue. If, if it decides to stop, it sends a signal to the backend, and the backend stops the trial. The second thing that can happen is that the backend has free work to do, then it says, hey, I have, I have something to do, what should I do? And the HBO method then um, you know, looks at its uh, kind of decision-making method and suggests a new configuration for a trial to run, right? And sends that back to the backend, and then the backend starts the trial or resumes the trial. So SignTune is... Uh, is implemented in, an, in a backend agnostic way, so you can, in some sense, uh, plug in your own backend, but of course, to get you started, we have a few backends in there. Uh, the simplest one is the local execution backend, um, and that's very simple. That just runs on a single machine, and it kind of uh, makes use of the resources that are available on that machine, um, and it runs trials uh, potentially as separate processes on that machine. So, for example, if the machine has four GPUs, then you can run four trials in parallel, or if you kind of a CPU on a CPU machine, it depends how many cores you have. Um, and the number of workers that are supported by the backend are just uh, basically fixed uh, by uh, what machine you run it on. And uh, so this can run locally on your machine, on your laptop, if dependencies uh, of training scripts are installed there. But this is, of course, pretty tedious, uh, and it's not very fast. So if you want to sort of make decisions uh, faster, you want to sort of get your experiments done faster, you can simply just run them in parallel, right? So that's one way of speeding up uh, experimentation. And that's, uh, that's fairly easy to do in SignTune by simply just launching experiments remotely. So now we take kind of an experiment that runs with a local backend, and we just uh, send it to the cloud and we run them in parallel as uh, SageMaker uh, training jobs. So that's really quite easy because you don't need to build a Docker image. Dependencies are just managed automatically, and you can choose any instance type you like, and for the local backend, you might want to choose something that supports a certain number of workers, maybe several GPUs. 
Okay, so here's a very uh, basic comparison study that I ran using kind of this parallel execution of the local backend. Um, I just ran uh, 40 experiments in parallel. Um, there are four methods we compare and 10 repetitions. It's important to re repeat things in order to understand the stochasticity in this process. So there's stochasticity in the training, there's stochasticity in the decision making, like random search. Um, and, uh, and in order to understand like the significance of your results, you should always repeat. Of course, that's expensive. Um, and each of these uh, training runs is, uh, is run for, uh, so, sorry, each of these experiments is run for maximum of five hours. So the local backend in this case can run four trials in parallel because it has four GPUs. Then the results are all written to cloud storage and there's uh, tools included for aggregation and visualization, so that's re all very easy. So here are some results. So, so what am I showing here? So I'm showing kind of um, uh, aggregate statistics, uh, so along wall clock time. And these statistics are, in this case, a robust variant of the mean, uh, interquartile mean. You can also pick the median or the mean if you want that. And then I'm also showing a bootstrap confidence interval. So the visualization supports different things. So in this case, uh, we see that random search is doing uh, the worst. It's a simple baseline. And it can be very much outperformed by using Bayesian optimization on this problem, which gets you to a better point, And it also descends faster. Asha is actually descending quite quickly uh, initially. That's because it can very quickly understand which trials not to run very long. But it then also kind of levels out because it's still kind of plagued by the uh, random nature of uh, it's, it's kind of an explore only method. It only exploits because of the, uh, because of the kind of stopping ideas. And then uh, the, the model-based variant of Asha is kind of outperforming, give, gives you the best of both worlds. In this case, it's kind of descending very rapidly, even faster than Asha, because it quickly learns about uh, the particular nature of these hyperparameters. And then it gets you also to, the, to, a, to a very good place, the same place, basically, that BO gets you to. OK, and all of these methods don't need, I mean, they, they all have some default parameters. And you don't really, I mean, if you want to set them, set them. But you can just run them just as easily as random search. It's also interesting. SignTune also has some tools for digging into why there are certain differences. So for example, you can easily plot learning curves of single seeds in this case. So here we can look at the difference between random search and uh, BO. So uh, random search is kind of you know, doing, all these, uh, doing all these evaluations, but you can kind of quickly observe that it's kind of repeating the same mistakes, right? It's kind of at the, you know, it's sampling these pretty poor configurations at a constant rate. And that's what you would expect, because it's just picking them at random. It doesn't really learn anything. I mean, it gets lucky now and then. So it's, it, it gets you eventually to a good point, but it might take a while. So BO is also making mistakes at the beginning. It's hard to see. But it quickly kind of learns some properties about the configuration space. It learns where, where to not sample because it's just too poor. And then it basically spends its effort on configuration that just do better. And that's why it, it also gets you down to a better place. OK, so in this case, this idea of you know, making use of what you've observed in the past really pays off. Um, if you compare random search with Asha, then you see why Asha does better, right? So it, again, it repeats mistakes at the same constant rate, right? But it, it can stop these things very early because in these rung levels, it has the information to understand that these are actually bad uh, positions. But it still needs to spend a certain amount of its budget on these configurations. So that allows it to sort of uh, descend much more quickly, right? But in the end, it's also sort of limited by this random exploration. And finally, you can also compare BO with, um, uh, with a model-based uh, Asha or Mobster. And there you see that um, you know, Mobster is uh, basically combining these two ideas to really understand uh, what's going on. And so it quickly learns about uh, some things that you shouldn't do in the search space. So it, it kind of still does exploration here. And it sort of still uh, samples configurations that are not so great. But uh, that's, that's basically what you should do in explore exploit trade-off. But it really avoids the worst, right? It, it has learned about that. So it's kind of getting you to a, a, a very good place, and it's doing so pretty rapidly. So it has the best, like, any time performance in this case. 
So another, um, another way of um, speeding up uh, experimentation is to run, simply run more trials in parallel. Right? So in, in the last uh, case, we did four trials, but that's about how much we could do. And so what about if I run more than four? So um, in order to do that, in order to basically have the full freedom about how many things you want to run in parallel, you, you, want, you might want to go to the distributed uh, case. And in this case, we offer you a, a backend that we call SageMake Execution Backend. Um, and here the idea is in, uh, we actually run every trial as a separate uh, SageMaker training job. Okay, so uh, all the resources on that instance can be used for your training. Uh, so that can speed things up, and then you can also use as, as many as you can afford, so you can basically run experiments with different number of workers and compare uh, against each other. And then you can also see how different methods fare under these different circumstances. So that's what I did in a, in a second little experiment. It's again using these four methods. And uh, we are now going to run 60 experiments for four methods, but five repetitions, because this is a little more expensive. And, uh, and then I'm going to also compare different number of workers. So I'm going to look at, so four we already had, but it's a different backend, and now two, and also double that eight. So the SageMaker backend runs all these things in parallel on separate worker um, instances, and uh, it, uh, I'm going to run five hours, like before, for four and eight workers, and I'm going to run double, double that for two workers to see what's going to happen there. Okay, so here are the results for the methods that uh, do random uh, sampling to make their decisions, right? So that's random search in Usher. And I think we can very nicely see what I said before, right, that they kind of give you a, roughly a linear speed up. Because uh, roughly speaking, uh, the five hours cut off for, this is four workers, the orange one, is roughly where you get to after twice the time with two workers. Right, that's kind of how, what you would expect if you just do things at random. And, sorry? Are these all for the transformer example you gave at the beginning? Yeah, this is all the same example, yes, yes. And then, uh, you know, the, the, uh, if you use twice the number of workers, then you are uh, then you're roughly twice as fast. So even after two and a half hours, you already get to where you are with four workers after five hours. So this is kind of a linear speed up. That's what you would expect from random search. In Asha, it's similar. I think it's a little bit hidden by the fact that it does uh, some clever tricks with the early stopping. But I think in general, you can also observe further down a more, la more or less like a linear speed up, right? So here you're five hours, and you need a little more, uh, something twice like that in, uh, with two workers. And you need about half that uh, with, with eight workers. Right. So indeed, for these kind of methods that do random exploration as their base principle of making decisions, uh, the, you, you can basically just expect that if you throw more hardware at them, they, they just do better. I mean, up, up to some point. Right? Um, the story is a little bit different for the model-based ones. Um, for BO, I would say that, yes, I mean, going from two to four workers really helps. It's about possibly linear speed up. Um, but then going from four to eight hardly helps at all, right? So here you would sim simply just waste your efforts, and you could rather use the parallel uh, resources that you have by r to run more experiments. So in this case, the model-based idea, the sequential idea of updating is simply just powerful enough to kind of combat this uh, simple idea of just throwing more hardware at things. So you're simply just being more sample efficient with these methods, and so you sometimes can basically be more frugal when it comes to parallel resources spent uh, on the same experiment. And then in Mobster, it's even more interesting because here, even, the, even if you run things with two workers, it kind of gets you after five hours to a pretty good point that you would then also get to when you do four or eight workers. So in this case, this model-based method is actually doing pretty, pretty well already with two workers. Right? So... Um, I, I think maybe that's also a, a kind of um, possibly an incentive for people to go and try some model-based methods instead of these simple baselines because it simply uh, can save you a lot of compute time that you should potentially spend in other ways, right? For example, by running more experiments and learning more about your, uh, about the kind of the aspects of the model that HBO is not so good at figuring them out. 
Okay, so there's uh, a lot of uh, details that, um, that I'm missing here that I, uh, that I didn't talk about, um, but there's a complete online tutorial. Oh, shit. All right, sorry. There's a kind of a complete online tutorial uh, that you can have a look at and go through all the um, scripts and the code and the explanations of how this works for this example. And there's also more documentation on the SignTune uh, website um, that uh, shows you how to run uh, kind of experiments and parallelize them in SignTune. Okay, now um, uh, for the final part, uh, David, David and me are going to look at, um, you know, how uh, dive a little bit deeper into how to simulate experiments um, in a realistic way from surrogate benchmarks in SignTune. So the examples that I showed before, we use our real compute on these expensive instances. Now we're going to go for simulations. Okay, David. Thanks, Matthias. So, yeah, so those experiments Matthias just show are still pretty expensive. You need to train transformers uh, for all uh, those uh, trials. So even if you do those uh, Ansha and Mobster, it's more efficient, but it's still so expensive to compare all those seeds, right? So, um, yeah, this part we're going to show some tools so that, I mean, any, uh, I mean, researcher or grad student without, you know, a lot of GPU at hand can do those experiments. Um, yeah, right, so if you have uh, been at the Autogluon tutorial, uh, I guess you already see this slide, saw this slide, but so it's a great example because it's a, just another um, kind of application of those pre-computed results. So pre-computed results, it, technically we, um, it consists like, so we are going to evaluate many models and data set seed combination, and then we put uh, all of that in a database. So it may be uh, pretty expensive. So maybe you do that or someone else uh, does it. Uh, in this case for this, what we're going to show, we are just reusing lots of pre-computed results uh, done by overlaps and um, to perform simulation. So, and then what you can do is that instead of, so let's say if there is in your random search at some point, you sample uh, this hyperparameter and you want to see the result, you're not training the model from scratch, but you're just calling this table and getting the result. Of course, that you can do very fast because you just do a lookup table. So there is a question, if this value is not there, I will come back to it. Uh, so three application. So the main one that we are going, uh, that we are talking about uh, for SignTune is that you can compare the performance of new hyperparameter optimization NAS uh, method, whatever with random search, for instance. So here, this paper, I'm showing some uh, one result from NAS 201. So they acquired many architectures, and then they could compare lots and lots of methods for 500 seeds. Of course, if you were to do that uh, without pre-computed result, it would be a uh, horribly expensive, but now you can do all of that for free. Another application that is possible is that you can perform meta-learning, so you can use all this data to learn some, something that like a method that you say, given a new data set, what are good pot uh, potential configurations. Um, so here I'm showing some uh, results from uh, Autotake Learn. So you have support for that in SignTune, so we are not going to um, show results, but you have like benchmark and lots of methods available for that. And the last one is um, you can use uh, those results to um, strengthen your empirical comparison. So here, uh, do I have a pointer? Uh, maybe I'll use the mouse. <laughs> Um, so I'm showing some um, a figure from a paper from uh, ICML uh, last year that got an outstanding award. And what they did is that they evaluated uh, six reinforcement learning algorithms on all Atari games for, um, I think it's 100 seeds, which is way more than what uh, people do normally. But then they could really look at like, okay, uh, what is the signal to noise ratio in a sense? And then they compare, they show the world distribution they obtained with those 100 seeds. 
So in orange, you see, for instance, the distribution of one algorithm. And here you see uh, this bar, the result that was reported by the author. And so in all those distribution, the result reported is very far from the mean of the distribution, which highlighted a huge uh, statistical problem in a sense. Um, so, but in, in this tutorial, I'm going to, uh, we are going to focus more on this part and how you can do that with fine tune. So in particular, I'm going to briefly show some uh, uh, tooling that we did so that you can perform all the simulation, you can access all those benchmarks uh, easily. So black, in, in SciTune, black box repository is a module which has uh, lots of lots of pre-computed results available. So we did not acquire them uh, ourselves, so we, but we just used lots of nice work done by other labs. Um, so you have uh, NASBench and FCNet, which is basically a lot of uh, hyperparameter optimization architecture evaluated on a few data sets. You have NAS201, which is like a uh, lot of computer vision architecture evaluated on three data sets, LCBench, a lot of um, PyTorch architecture evaluated, PD1, so on and so forth. We also have uh, some more, I mean, NAS301, XGBoost, and SVM, and tons of other cool um, black boxes. This, is, this comes from Yapo Gym. Uh, I, I, I've not seen Florian uh, Fister, but I'm, I'm grateful for this because it's a nice collaboration so that we could uh, include that. And so this repository, it provides a unified way to download and, uh, and process automatically each of those. So in one line of code, you can get any of those and same line of code. Um, I'll show also that we have, um, kind of, you can access evaluation with the same API and you have very fast lookup times. Uh, you can add any surrogate on the fly. You support transfer learning, so I'm not going to demo that, but um, we have lots of examples and methods. And, and then, so that would be Matthias. He will show in detail how you can use all that stuff to perform um, simulation for asynchronous tuning. All right, so the first functionality is loading a black box. Um, you start by, uh, you have to, uh, you have to start somewhere, so you just uh, write. So from SignTune, you import a lot of black box, and um, you import one of those. So for instance, here I'm importing LCBench, and you can print all the data set it contains. So in this case, it contains, uh, I don't know, a bunch, and so we just load one of them, which is like fashion and list. And then we can query evaluations by just passing one configuration. And, uh, and, and, and that's it, so we get um, the accuracy, training time, and a bunch of uh, metrics. So one thing that is important is like the runtime to do that is pretty low. Also, it's the same runtime if you use a lot of fidelities. This, is ma this makes it very fast for simulation. So it's the same runtime if you pass multi-fidelity because we kind of use under the hood some uh, vectorization. Um, and I'm saying this, so it may look like a, right, who cares about a 100 milliseconds or even 500 milliseconds, but in, when you do this simulation for Asha and stuff, you are querying this um, black box millions or billions of times, so that makes your experiments going from like, you know, days or sometimes uh, minutes or hours, so it is actually pretty important. One thing is, um, let's say you sample a random hyperparameter, and then you say, yeah, what's the result for that? Yeah, you'll get an error. Uh, you'll get an error because in this case, not, not all possible hyperparameters were evaluated, right? Of course, so for instance, the learning rate, uh, you can't realistically evaluate all the floats. Um, so that's annoying. So one thing you can do um, in this, uh, I mean, in SignTune and in this repository, yeah, you can just add a surrogate on the fly uh, with just this line of code. So black box surrogate equal add surrogate uh, um, uh, black box, and that's it, then you can query it. So by default, it, um, it uses a nearest neighbor, and then, uh, then you get a result. But an a nice thing is that, yeah, you can use any uh, method from scikit-learn, so any pipeline, uh, as long as it has like a scikit-learn uh, API. So here, we're using three different surrogates, uh, like a nearest neighbor, a linear regression, MLP, but you could have used XGBoost, different hyperparameters, and here I'm just showing um, a simple code so that, I mean, we just change the dropout um, from uh, zero to one and we are currying all the surrogates and uh, yeah, we obtain this plot. So, it, I mean, it's just uh, to show 
um, <laughs> that, you, that you can uh, do it. But so the, for instance, for research, uh, you can just have a quick look and you take any of those benchmarks and say, yeah, right, Exibus probably is not important. And um, as far as I know, otherwise most uh, repository, the surrogate is very tied to your benchmark, so you cannot really change them uh, that easily. Um, yeah, so that's that's uh, what we saw, so like a unified way to query uh, evaluation and answer gate on the fly. So that's all good, but ultimately we don't just want to evaluate the black box in itself. It's not uh, that meaningful. What we want to, is to compare methods, and particularly we want maybe to compare methods such as ASHA, and uh, when you have multiple workers, and this presents some challenge um, that Matthias is going to talk about now on how you can perform that. Yeah, yeah so uh, exactly. So now we kind of uh, know what the black box repository is. Um, and uh, now we're going to see how we can draw the bridge between this uh, wealth of data and surrogate benchmarks and uh, sort of getting results out of our HBO methods in a comparison. And that's being done simply by defining another backend, right? So because it's just another backend, it basically just works with any HBO method um, that you want to, may, may want to compare against that's implemented in sign tune. And it also supports any surrogate, uh, subject to the fact that the surrogate contains training times. I mean, we need times in order to create realistic uh, results with respect to walk clock time. Um, it simulates asynchronous scheduling for any number of workers. So that's, that's good because you don't need to really pay for that. Um, and it also provides realistic work clock time results. And this does that many, many times faster than real time. And I just want to get uh, across how this uh, simulator backend works. And that's why I, oh, oh, just to remind you about the basic interaction between the HBO method and the execution backend. So there's uh, kind of this kind of, uh, you know, backend has a new result, and then the HBO method can issue a stop command, or the other interaction is if there's a free worker, then the HBO method is asked to suggest a new configuration. So just to, um, just to uh, get across how this simulator works, I uh, basically created a toy example. That's kind of a surrogate benchmark. If you want a neural network trained for three epochs, um, the simula ba simulator backend supports two workers in this case, and the HBO method implements early stopping. So um, this is kind of how these uh, backend and HBO method come together in sign tune. There's a tuning loop, which is kind of running until the stopping criterion is met, maybe five hours are over. And in this tuning loop, two things happen. I mean, either um, there are new results that the backend wants to tell us about. If so, then we asked uh, the HBO method uh, to update its knowledge state and also tell us what to do with these trials that report it. And if that decision is stopped, then we ask the backend to stop, right? That was the first one. Then in the same loop, the second thing that can happen is the backend has some free workers and can say, you know, how many they have. And then for each of them, we ask the HBO method to suggest the config. And then we ask the backend to start that trial. And then because of most of the time, these two things don't happen, right? Most of the time, everybody's busy and nothing is reported. We also introduce a sleep statement at the end of the run. Maybe you just wait for a second until you just, uh, un un unless you're just uh, wasting your effort here. And uh, so how does, sim so normally the sleep sleeper is, sleep, uh, uh, is, is done by a timekeeper, which is just simulating, uh, which is basically just waiting for one second or so, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a normal clock that moves forward in time. In the simulator, this is, uh, this is a concept that we're going to control. So the timekeeper in the simulator is just something that I can move forward in discrete units, and it's just a number. It always goes, uh, uh, it always moves to the positive line. Uh, the second ingredient in the simulator backend that we need is a, is a priority queue. And in this queue, we are simply just going to enter uh, result events that are going to happen in the future, right? And we are going to enter them at the time when they're supposed to happen in the simulated time scale. OK, so let's just see how that works. So we are at the time zero, and uh, the backend has two free workers. So it just says, I have two free workers. Um, and now I'm going to ask the HBO method to suggest a configuration. 
Um, and then, you know, that, that might be VO or so. And then um, the backend starts the trial. And now uh, happens what David just uh, talked about. Uh, the backend now actually, instead of just starting this trial and running it, it actually asks the, uh, the black box repository for the results that it, it would have got, it, it, it would get after these three different epochs, right? And it also asks about how, how much time it, it takes from, you know, from the start to epoch one and uh, from the epoch one to epoch two. And that allows us to enter these events into the, uh, into the priority queue. And this is also kind of, this event also contains the validation error here. Okay, so then the same thing happens for the second config, the second worker. And this one is, uh, is again taken from the black box and it's a little longer. So it's probably a bit more of an expensive configuration, so it, it takes a little more time to, to run through the different epochs. Okay, so now we are at the point in time where both workers are busy and nothing is reported yet, right? So then we can just move the time pointer forward in time, so we are at the end of this loop. So again, nothing happens. And now we are past uh, the first kind of event in the queue, right? So now at that point in time, every time we call the backend, we, we need to process everything that has happened before now, right? So in this case, what happened before now is that there is a result event coming from the trial. So the trial zero reports, I have something at epoch number one. So that's going to be sent to the HBO method and the HBO method updates its knowledge state, and then it says, I, for, for this one, I, I like you to continue. It's, it's, it's okay. I don't have any information to stop this. So now but both workers are busy again because it's continuing and nothing is reported, so the time pointer advances again. And now we are past the second uh, readout, uh, the second event. And again, so now we are kind of mopping that up and say that, that since uh, you know, just before now something happened, and we are going to uh, fetch it and send it also to the HBO method. HBO method updates its knowledge state, but now it's, it sees like this is not so good, I'm going to stop that one. And now what's going to happen is very simple, right? If you stop a trial, then it's not going to report uh, the, the other two results, so you can just remove them from the queue. Um, and anything before now, you can also think about them being removed. It's not important anymore, right? And now we have basically one worker free because we've stopped one of them. So the backend says, I have one worker free. Then we suggest another config, and then we kind of enter that into the queue, and so it goes on, right? So I, I hope that kind of conveyed a little bit about how this works. And importantly, the, the time point has moved forward. I mean, there's no, there's no real waiting time here, right? Every time we are at the end of the loop, we just advance the pointer. And any, any, anything that's happening here is essentially just looking up things in a very fast implementation of the black box or looking at a priority queue. So there's al almost no time being spent. So I don't know, um, you know, there's of course a, a little caveat here. In order to make this realistic, for any HBO method, you also need to account for the decision-making time, right? I mean, there's an experiment contains like training times, and they are often pretty high, um, but some, sometimes they're actually okay in XGBoost land or so, and then there's also decision-making time, and this can really count also. So for example, Bayesian optimization, and in particular, Mobster actually quite needs to fit Gaussian process models, and this takes some time, right? So how do we account for that time in the simulator backend? It's actually really quite easy to do that because you just imagine there's stuff happening in the back end and then there's stuff happening outside. So the only thing you need to do whenever you exit the back end, uh, any method, you kind of start a clock and then when you enter it again, you kind of stop it and you have the delta of what happened outside, right? So for example, uh, you know, I asked the back end to start a trial and then I sort of want to ask it to start another one but in, in between the HBO method has to suggest something and that takes some time. So then once I've measured that time, I just advance the time, time pointer and that kind of makes the back end realistic. So now we are accounting for the waiting time at the end of the loop and we are also accounting for the decision making time. Okay, so importantly, this you can again do, it's fully agnostic to which method you run. I mean, the only thing you need to do is to measure time um, that it took to run this method to do whatever it wants to do. Okay, so the reality is, uh, is a little more complicated, but, um, but kind of, uh, I think the gist is captured here. So we use more event types instead of result. We also use start, stop, and complete events. And the reason for that is 
that we want to allow for model delays. So for example, there might be delays between stopping something and or asked to stop something and it really completing or uh, between the last result being reported and completion and these delays you can also simulate. You can even have random variables in there that simulate stochasticity in, in this back end. And so that's all supported. Okay, so I, I just want to finally show you how this works in practice by having a, a little study that compares uh, synchronous and asynchronous HBO methods. So recall that synchronous multi-fidelity HBO had this delayed promotion decisions until the rung is fully occupied. And asynchronous multi-fidelity HBO gets away with that. It doesn't have any synchronization points. So what we would like to find out is for which type of decision-making methods to, uh, do these different ideas differ from each other. So uh, the, the, the fact that they differ, you can see that by just plotting, uh, again, a learning curve plot. And here you can see very nicely on the left-hand side, we have synchronous successive halving, which is synchronous. And you can really clearly see how it goes through the run. So this is, uh, it tries to first very hard to train a lot of things until one epoch. And then it sort of can promote some of them to three and then to nine and so on. And then finally, only one of them survives, right? And you see a lot of empty space here. So while it's busy to basically do all of these one epoch ones to complete that uh, rung, it cannot promote anything to higher rungs, right? While Asha is much more opportunistic. So you, you start with your uh, you know, one epoch trials, but then very early you see some promising ones and you promote them. And so you get just a lot more things uh, run towards the end. And this can be good or bad, but very often in, in practice, this is, actually a good, this is actually a good thing to do, right? Not always, but, but, but most of the time, right? Obviously, in synchronous, you get a very high quality like, estimate for what is a good configuration, but it takes very, very long to get that. You have to wait until here, until you can sort of promote that one. Okay, so let's just compare 10 methods uh, on 13 different surrogate benchmarks and use study repetitions. Now we can just afford that because it's kind of cheap to simulate. This is about uh, 3,900 experiments. And if you just, uh, you know, would run all of them one after the other and you would kind of spend the real time that, are, that, that you read out from the surrogates, then this would take, um, you know, I think two years or 562 days. In, in, in simulation, this is done in a few hours. So that kind of shows you how, how much faster you can get. And I have to say that the only reason this, is, this takes a few hours and not a few minutes is, like David already mentioned, is actually the decision-making time behind these BO methods. Because they, they, you really need to pay for them, right? I mean, you don't need to pay for the training, but you need to pay for that. There's also, we can also afford pa paired comparisons to get smaller error bars here but by using the same random choices in each repetition because the methods are implemented in the, using the same components. So this is how, how you set up such a study. Again, you simply just select the methods that you want to use, and we use kind of two non-multi-fidelity baselines, random search and BO. Then we use like five uh, asynchronous methods like Asha, Mobster, Hypertune, Dipo, which is a more recent idea of scheduling, and then uh, the median stopping rule, which is a simple uh, heuristic. And then we also use three synchronous methods, which are synchronous hyperband, uh, sorry, synchronous successive halving, synchronous hyperband, which is an extension of successive halving. And then we also use the combination of synchronous scheduling with uh, kind of our BO model, which we call synchronous mobster. And that's, so, so that's the methods we want to compare. Then the baselines we want to compare them on, you just pick them uh, out of the benchmark repository. And you know, these, are, these are three NAS bench uh, ones, one NAS bench 301 four FCNet and five LC bench, so this gives 13 in total. So this, this is enough in order to define such a comparison. Um, so then we get some results, so we get kind of uh, trial, uh, kind of war clock time plots for every um, different benchmark. Um, and you can see that uh, if, we do, if we look at NAS bench 201 on the most expensive data set, then we see that uh, the synchronous, asynchronous methods do have an edge. Right, they, 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 especially the model-based ones, they descend faster. Uh, the heuristic, uh, the medium stopping rule is not doing so well. In general, multi-fidelity helps, so random search and BO are not doing so well here. And, uh, and also the synchronous methods, they kind of have this plateauing behavior, which is probably due to the fact that it takes them so long to, take, to get something to the highest number of epochs. 
Then we can also look at uh, LC bench where the story is uh, a little bit more mixed. So here the synchronous methods are doing better. Uh, again, now, now in this case, the dipo method is doing best. Um, and BO is actually doing quite well on these benchmarks. They are like a little cheaper. And then finally, maybe the hardest uh, benchmark in terms of running training time is the NASBench 301, where uh, the, the synchronous methods really don't do very well. They really plateau out here. Uh, while the asynchronous ones uh, show a, a nice behavior. This is after 12 hours simulated time. Okay, so um, then we can kind of drill down into why that is. And, and again, this is a very nice illustration of why synchronous scheduling in this case is, is maybe not the right thing to do. So it just spends a lot of time going through this first sort of rung level system and it manages to maybe get two to the highest rung. And before it can sort of repeat that a second time, it, the time is basically over, while Asha is much more opportunistic and sort of manages to get many things to the highest uh, rung level, which is important in these benchmarks, right? Okay, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's what you can do. All of these uh, um, kind of results are basically obtained in a, in a few hours, uh, and, and then you can do the plots instantaneously. Okay, so let me conclude um, this tutorial. So comparing HBO methods is, is difficult and it can be very time consuming. Um, surrogate benchmarks can really slash the costs, but uh, they are confounding factors that remain. And then tools uh, like SignTune can help uh, with, uh, you know, getting, uh, alleviating some of these confounding factors by basically having a pretty clear separation between the HBO decision making and which you typically want to compare with each other and the execution backend. It also contains many baselines and it's easy to extend them. Um, so you can run your personal method against all these backends. Uh, it, it's very simple to parallelize experimentation. Um, it's just a script basically. And then the, if you are interested in simulating experiments from surrogate benchmarks, I, I highly recommend you have a look at the simulator uh, backend and the black box repository because you get walk clock time realistic results uh, orders of magnitude faster than real time. So SignTune is, uh, is up on GitHub. Uh, I, I encourage you to look at it, maybe go through the uh, tutorial that complements these, uh, these things that I showed earlier. And if you like it, uh, you know, give us a star. We're always uh, happy to get recognition from the open source community. Yeah, with that, I would like to thank you. All right, thank you very much for the nice tutorial. I will just start the floor with questions by voicing one from Zoom. Uh, here's a question on the execution backend. Can the trial be paused and continued afterwards, or do we have to restart evaluation from scratch after stopping a trial? Um. So, um, so if you want to uh, pause and resume, you have to implement uh, checkpointing, which uh, for, for many, for PyTorch, we in include some code, uh, but you can also use your own checkpointing. If you do not want to implement checkpointing, then it will do what uh, the question said. It will start from scratch, but that's not advisable. Usually, you should checkpoint. Uh, and you, if you do that, you can just, uh, I mean, I have another script that I didn't want to show you. It's a, two more lines of code where you put some checkpoints and read the checkpoint at the right place, and then it's going to be fine. All right, thank you. Other questions? The simulator supports both, so if you want to know how much checkpointing helps you, then you can switch it on or off. Okay, let's see. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Maybe on the same lines, uh, while setting up, let's say we are setting up a trial on local uh, instead of like uh, distributed, and you are like having some, some number of workers where your run environment is are being in installed, the dependencies which we need. Does it also provide out of the box caching so that maybe when we start a trial again, the run environment may not take as much as time to get installed and then start the trial? So we support syncing checkpoints to cloud storage. That's, that's all supported. So, uh, I mean, you need to write these checkpoints. For, for PyTorch models, we include the code to do that. But if you use Hugging Face, we have examples uh, how you easily can just use Hugging Face checkpointing in order to support that. And then if you're in the cloud backend, this is automatically synced to the 
to the cloud storage, so you, you, you will, it will retrieve these checkpoints. Yeah, that's, that's built in. And it's only uh, either local or in AWS, or is it constrained to that, or can you also use other cloud providers or own clusters, uh, set, set, set own clusters, something like that? Yeah, you can totally do that. It's just that then you have to sort of implement our backend API, which is actually I highly encourage people to try because it's very easy. It's a very simple API. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a way of executing your trials, then that's, that's one way. There's also an um, ask-tell way of running our, uh, which might be another way of doing things. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, similar question, actually, but uh, in the context of benchmarks, so certain optimizers might want to uh, go back to a previously stopped configuration and restart that. Uh, and in that case, how does the simulated timing match up? Do, does it then uh, figure out the difference for the new extra iterations and adjust the simulated time line as well? Yeah, sure, because we basically have readouts for every epoch, right? So then we can basically figure out, do we, you know, do we need to start from scratch, or do we, can we start from the point where you checkpointed? So that, that's how it works. And you can do either. So you can say, you know, I'm, I mean, usually the default is to use checkpointing in the simulator, because we assume that that's what you do. So, so I guess the time, because benchmark or surrogates typically give the total cost of training till that epoch. So I guess the subtraction part is handled by you in your simulator. Yes, then. yes. OK. And maybe one more. Uh, so do we also need to run n processes to like simulate n workers when simulating the uh, benchmarking runs? Uh, sorry, I can you do repeat like, that? So if we have to simulate, and like, I think you showed graphs for like four workers, you said. So do, do you, are you also running exactly four processes or four workers? I know uh, this. Uh, I mean, I mean this, the simulator is running on a on a single process. Okay. Uh, that's like you know, that's fully. It's just this queue, right? So, okay. okay. And you can just enter anything in that queue, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you then. Uh, okay. Over here. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it's a question about the quick question about the black box repository. Uh, it, do you have, um, for each configuration, you have uh, information about the predictions themselves done by the uh, configuration, or only metrics like the accuracy and, uh, and such? Mm. In general. So to, be, to be sure I understand your question, mm. so do you, are you saying do we have both the prediction of the surrogate and the true value? I, 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 I'm um, not sure I got it. Uh, I meant uh, for a certain configuration and so a certain model, you have predictions that are made, and from those predictions, you get the accuracy. Or um, do you directly have the accuracy and some metrics? Or do you have the predictions themselves from which we could uh, find other metrics? So for example, if uh, something was done using the accuracy, and then someone wanted to optimize the MCC, could, would it be possible? Hmm. Do, do you mean whether we have checkpoints for the model? Uh, no, uh, for yes, the surrogate. Ben have. I'm sorry, I'm really bad at explaining it. Uh, for the surrogate benchmark, uh, mm -hmm. for one configuration, you have an evaluation from it, and do you have an evaluation that is really uh, a metric, or is it uh, a confusion matrix or a prediction, a list of prediction from which we could infer other metrics? In general. It's not I'm, something you have a lot of control over, I think. But. So I'm not, uh, yeah, but we can uh, catch up later. I'm not entirely okay. sure I got your question. So, but when you use a surrogate yeah. for any hyper, I mean, any hyperparameter in the space, mm. you're going to have like values which comes from the, yeah. So yeah. So oh. Whether we have single point prediction on everything on the test set mm. where we have that. Okay. Uh, I mean, usually that's not what people do. I mean, we, yeah. we could do that, uh, but people, that's not typically what people publish. Oh, okay. It's quite expensive, right? If the test that is large. Ah, I got that. Uh, thank you for the nice tutorial. Uh, I was wondering one thing. So uh, you showed here the fidelity where you have a uh, number of iterations. Do you also have support uh, other fidelities, like uh, number of training samples, or 
And do you have any idea how difficult it is to implement a new fidelity in your framework? Um, you can use any any fidelity you want in these algorithms, but you basically then need to sort of just implement the, the, the evaluation script, right? The training script. At, at present, we don't have. Uh, I think we don't have benchmarks. So, so we have in uh, due to Florian uh, Florian Plister, we have like uh, some benchmark for Yapo, where the fidelity is uh, size of the data set, like the subsampling ratio, uh, and this is integrated. You can. Do that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, two quick questions, uh, straightforward, uh, about the black box repository most. So, yeah, when you have surrogate benchmarks, you sometimes want to fit different surrogates to different uh, metrics, right? So, is it easy to do that in the, in the API, or you just fit one surrogate to all metrics? So, that's the first question. The second question, uh, what was it? Okay, maybe <laughs> the first question. Okay, yeah. Thanks for this question. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, you can because you can give any scikit-learn pipeline. So your pipeline could say for this metric and it's going to do that. And so you just need a fit and predict. It's just like you're not going to be able to do uh, this just linear regression from uh, scikit-learn, but you could do your custom pipeline that for time do this and for accuracy do that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, then the second question was uh, how easy is it to create new surrogate benchmarks? So does it allow, like, to, for instance, does it only support only existing surrogate benchmark to add them to the existing API, or? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's relatively straightforward. So in particular, if you're in a standard setting where you have like a, a tensor, which is like number of hyperparameters, number of seeds, uh, number of time steps, and then it's very straightforward. Like you can just uh, import a class and, and save it. Uh, it's also possible in other cases, so Yapogym was a bit different because it has its own surrogate, right? Uh, so, and, um, but it's also possible, and there are like lots of examples uh, for that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, um, yeah thanks. Um, related question to this about surrogate benchmarks. Um, so the default you said is, is a, a nearest neighbor, which is of course simple, but you know, also not the best surrogate. Um, better surrogates, surrogates, in our experience, sometimes can get pretty big. And then, then what do you do? Do you have, um, do you just need it locally once, or when you have different, you never have to spread that across workers, do you? Uh, you mean across workers? So the surrogate, typically, you, as Matthias said, it, it runs, uh, the simulation runs in one process, one machine, because you don't need a, you know, a, it's about cheap, right? You just uh, move forward in time with a queue. So then you just feed the surrogate there and just live on this machine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And good. Um, that, that's what I hope for. Um, and then in terms of results, so um, you showed some results that also had Dipo in there, and um, Dipo is not, it's not the full version from the paper, is it? And is, is there anything blocking? Because we were just really uh, wondering, how do we compare to Dipo? Do we compare to um, Arlen's re-implementation? Martin's version is not there. There is this version. And, and um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, what, that's what a bit we confusing. We, we ch also changed the documentation. So the Dipo is two ideas in one. And one of them is how to do the scheduling in a different way. And the other one is what the uh, probabilistic model is. And we only implemented the first one and used the probabilistic model that we normally use. Um, I think in terms of uh, using uh, Martin's code, it would be uh, basically um, putting it in there, right? Um, just implementing it. Can you do that? We, we can't. <laughs> we don't have it. OK, we can ask, we can ask him, right? Is, is it? I mean, oh, there is a re-implementation by the other co-author, but it, it's sort of not the official code, so it's a meh. It might, may or may not be as good. So I it's just it from a scientific perspective of what should the community use compared to and so on. Yeah, we, I mean, Martin is around, uh, so maybe you can ask him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding the plot where you showed that BO doesn't profit too much like from parallelism up to a certain point, um, or from a certain point on anymore. Um, 
I was wondering, did you play around like with the um, acquisition function there there a little bit? Because like um, it probably depends a bit on the acquisition function. I mean, of course, it's like an inherent sequential process. Um, I think Frank also has a paper on that where they showed that if you use like UCB cleverly, um, that helps a little bit. Um, did you experiment with that a little bit? Uh, no, this is all done with the defaults here. We just wanted to show everything is just the defaults, um, the EI basically. Um, but I, I think the, the message is a little different. I, I, I don't want to say that, uh, I, I just want to say that this simple idea of just throwing more resources at a method is something that helps you with, to some extent, with random methods. But for, for model based methods, often you, you, you just don't need to do that, right? So I, I mean, yes, you could then sort of, um, I mean, that's subject to the benchmark, right? If the benchmark is very difficult, then you probably get initial random behavior, and so you need to. You can again, you know, improve uh, using a lot of resources. I mean, you could be clever in dialing the resources down later on, but <clears throat> I think it was more about pointing that out, right? That you can be more frugal if you use a model-based method. Okay, thanks. I think, uh, let's do here first. That's. Hi, I have another question about uh, checkpointing. Uh, so if you have a learning rate scheduler, right, and that is very much tied to the fidelity, for example, number of epochs, then like loading that from the checkpoint for a higher fidelity is necessarily not the right thing to do because uh, the learning rate schedule depends on the number of epochs. And how do you uh, deal with it or how do you recommend uh, someone deals with it? So, the, uh, the <clears throat> so anything that has a state you need to include in the checkpoint. So the, the model, the optimizer, and the learning rate scheduler. Yeah, but the learning rate scheduler for uh, something that runs for 100 epoch would look very different from a scheduler that runs for a smaller budget, say 50 epochs. The, the two schedules would look different. So if you are loading uh, uh, like the state of the scheduler of a previous fidelity, that's the wrong thing to do, right? You would like a new scheduler for the full budget, and the two uh, scheduler curves would look very different. I mean, I, I don't know, but the idea of a checkpoint and resume from a checkpoint is that it should behave exactly as if you hadn't checkpointed, as if you had just continued that, and that's what we do. But if that's not what you want to do, then you have to, then you have to tweak it, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea is really to also, so if there's a learning rate decay that depends on the number of epochs, then you need to checkpoint that as well, and then you, when, when you resume, it basically resumes from that point, and so you, you are at that point, right? So if you, mm -hmm. so, but, but if that's not what you want to do, then, then you have to do something different. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, great, great, uh, um, great work. I was wondering uh, in terms of extensibility, right? So if I add new baselines, would you then also compute all the, all, all the, all the results for new um, circuits? And second, if I extend with a new HPO method, how would I do that? And would that also require more work? Or can you comment on that? So, um, <clears throat> I mean, we are not kind of saying that whenever you give us a model, we, we compute in a yeah. black box for you. Actually, we haven't really computed any black boxes ourselves, except on a smaller scale. You, you've done that, right? So we just import black boxes here and, and make them available through the repository. And in terms of an HBO method, yeah, sure, it's just on GitHub. Anybody can contribute, and we would very much encourage you to do that. And once you have done that, you can compare it within this framework using these different backends against all these baselines. Yeah, right? and, and you can even just sort of take um, these implementations, uh, they're, they're, they're pretty simple, so you might actually not have to start from scratch if you, wanna, if you have an idea about asynchronous successive halving in a, in a new way, um, then, <clears throat> then you can maybe just start, not, not start from zero, just start from our code and it's going to be easier. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, I just have a question regarding to the black box uh, repository. So, um, so there are tabular benchmark and also uh, this uh, surrogate benchmark. And do you observe different behavior for the same uh, optimizer for these different two types of benchmarks? And is it the, like the best choice in practice that you always use a surrogate uh, benchmark if available? Yeah, so we did not do uh, this kind of research in that direction, uh -huh. uh, but there are like a bunch of papers that are comparing tabula and surrogate benchmark. And I think the general, uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm scared to say the wrong conclusion, but as far as I could see where it's going is like surrogate, uh, that's pretty better because this interpolation helps. So I mean, I, if you want, I can point you to some papers uh, toward that. So that would be my general recommendation from what I remember. Maybe someone in the audience has a authoritative uh, paper, but, um, but yeah, typically, um, surrogate benchmarks are better. OK, thank you. This together with Florian. So to chime in, the main takeaway is that if you have continuous search spaces, eventually surrogates strongly outperform the tabular ones because this discretization makes things way easier than they actually are when benchmarking on those continuous real search spaces. So for example, acquisition function optimization in BO is way easier if you have a discrete set of candidate points that you can just you can query all of them and find the arc marks for the continuous version and the search space in the surrogate benchmark is also continuous, that's more of a challenge in finding the arc marks of the acquisition function. So in general, if your surrogate model predicts well, then it's probably better to use a surrogate benchmark than a tabular version. Unless if you have like a fully categorical search space and you can exhaustively evaluate all, then tabular would be the way to go. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, I actually fully agreed. Um, nevertheless, when we publish paper or submit papers, we do need to um, be aware of the fact that some reviewers still don't get surrogate benchmarks and they to totally don't trust them. Uh, a table they will trust, but not a surrogate. And that is, as a community, we, we need to work on and just always kind of maybe put in a paragraph why this is actually a good idea and, and so on. So just, just encouraging you to do that. But yeah, just to add on that, also for categorical spaces, surrogates are better, actually. So we showed that in the NASBench 301 paper, comparing directly to NASBench 101, the tabular version. Yeah, so. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so great talk. Um, one question I have, which has always kind of been somewhat of the friction uh, with like ensembling methods and HPO, is that this is optimizing directly for the best single model, right? And have you thought about um, methods for like simulators, right, that also incorporate the fact that you could ensemble the models or have multiple model families? Yeah, the problem with that is if you, if you want to simulate that from a surrogate, then I think you would need what an earlier question asked about. You would kind of need predictions at each configuration of all uh, at all the test points, and then you could obviously do any ensemble you like, right? You could just, I mean, that's actually how people do it in practice. But uh, as long as you don't have that <clears throat> on the test set, then I mean, it's kind of hard to simulate an arbitrary ensemble unless you've evaluated all ensembles. Right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's why I think in our work that we, we shared yesterday that we didn't do that because we were already 4.5 terabytes with only getting the friction probabilities at one epoch, not at all of them. So. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you a lot for the insightful questions and great answers. So join me again in thanking the speakers. <laughs>